Today we're continuing our series that we are calling Wake Up. Go ahead and hit your neighbor in the arm and tell him, wake up. Wake up. Let's go. And we want to take a minute to welcome everybody who's joining us online. Hey, online family, we love you. We're so grateful you are a part of our family. And then we want to put our hands together for all the men and women Let's who are go. joining Come us on. in correctional facilities. All across the U.S., we are grateful that you are part of our family as well. Thank you for jumping online and being with us today. So let's pause just a little bit because we want to just kind of reflect on where we've been because whether you know this or not, today is a special Sunday in the history of our church. Today we're 11 years old. Come on, somebody. Let's go. Let's go. And so we're partying, we're celebrating all that God has done. 11 years, I keep saying this phrase, 11 years of God's goodness, 11 years of God's faithfulness. And so my wife and I, both born and raised on the west side of Jacksonville, and uh, we, come on, let's go west side, because the west side is the, let's get it, it's not, but it rhymes, so it works. And so... So we were student pastors at a church over on another part of the West Side, and uh, we were doing that for years. And I think I could have probably done student ministry the rest of my life. Um, my wife hated student ministry the day she stepped into it, and so we knew it wasn't going to be the long haul. And if you're a teenager in here, you're like, does she hate me? No, she loves you. She just doesn't want to work with you. Okay, that's what, that's what it means. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. And so, and so we did that for eight years, though, and um, just uh, really uh, were praying one day and just really felt the Spirit of God just leading us to, to start a life-giving church. And so um, through a lot of prayer and, and a lot of just really seeking God, we said, okay, God, we, we know we're going to start a church, um, and we know it's going to be in Jacksonville. Um, amen, amen. And we prayed anywhere but the west side, God. We've been here our whole lives Send us to the beach. Like, we'll take it. Let's go. And uh, honestly, it really didn't take much prayer. We knew from really day one that we were called to plant a church in our backyard, in our home. And uh, we love this city, and we love this area of the city. And this area of the city needs Jesus. Amen? Um, and some, a lot of people ask, does it need another church? It needs a 1,000 more churches. It needs more churches lifting up the name of Jesus. And so God called us here. And the funny part of our story is we were actually, we were on staff at, at her family's church. All of her family was at the church. And so when we left, we were basically leaving all of her family. And if your last name was Peterson, which is, which is my last name, our last name, because um, you married it, best day of your life when, when your name became Peterson. And um, why are y'all laughing? And, uh, and, and all of, if your name was Peterson, you, you had to start the church with us. And so I want to honor my parents um, who have been in our corner from day one. <laughs> Amen. They have... They have been financially blessing us to help us when we didn't have a job. Um, just so great. Gave us two cars. Like, just, you got to have parents like that. Let's go. And, uh, and then to my only sibling, my older brother and his wife, um, Aaron, who is now on our staff, <laughs> Pastor Aaron, our Next Steps pastor. Um, they've been with us since day one, and so I, I honor them. Um, Philip and Aaron, I honor your children who have... Um, just sewn into this house as well. What a gift they have been to us. Yeah, and then we want to honor our children. Uh, they're not sitting in this service. We had one sit in the first, and uh, Naomi will sit in the next service. But we've got three kids, Noah, Naomi, and Emmy. And they, uh, Noah and Naomi have served this house since day one. Come on. Um, they were two and four. And they came to set up and break down. And they took their little role in their job so seriously. And I'm so proud of them because... Um, it could be easy for them. They're here all the time, all the time. Uh, they're, and they're the first ones here, last ones to leave so often. And it could be easy for them to just be like, do I have to go serve again? Do I have to be there again? And we've had our days and our moments, but, but man, they love God's house and they love being in this place. And so they're members here as well. Like they are on the dream team as well. And so I honor my amazing kids for everything that they have done. You'll never see all the sacrifices that kids have to make for their parents yeah, yeah. to be in ministry. And, and you don't need to. Um, but I'm so grateful for the work that God's done in their life, and so we honor them. Absolutely. Our, our son, since sixth grade, has been serving in two-year-olds, and uh, he's, he's a junior now, so it's just faithful, consistent serving, and uh, they, those little two-year-olds used to drive him crazy. Now he loves them with all of his heart. It's incredible to watch the journey, um, and so we're just so grateful. You cried during the first service when you talked about that. Because my boy was in here. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. All right, so yeah, Naomi now. will be in the yeah. third, and you'll cry for again. her. Okay, fantastic, third. fantastic, yes. yeah. Yes. I'm just over here heartless, like just not, <laughs> no emotion. 
So let me give you the quick version of our church. We always love to reflect. It's good to remember where you've come from. A lot of you are brand new to our church um, and within the last year, and maybe you don't know our story. Um, but 2000, and uh, really it was 2011 that got put it on our heart to start the church, and we had to build a team. We started that in 2012, 11 of us in our living room, and we officially launched the church in August of 2013. Um, the 11 of us in our living room, uh, we outgrew it. Thank you, God. More people wanted to be a part of it. I don't know why, because we, we, there was only 11 of us. And, uh, but, but people joined our team, and we grew out of our living room and moved over to Eagles View Academy. And that's where we launched our church in 2013. And 179 people showed up on that first Sunday. Come on, somebody. So good. And you, you're, some of you aren't clapping. Like, like, that was a big deal, people, all right? And uh, we were giving away TVs and grills. I think that's the only reason people showed up. And uh, apparently, we did such a good job that first Sunday that 125 people came back the next Sunday. And we're like, oh, 50 less people. Fantastic. We're going, we're going down already. But we leveled out around there. And, and God was just so faithful to us. And, and we were three years um, at Eagles U Portable. What that means is um, it was not our building. Uh, we owned three 20-foot trailers that we stored all of our stuff in, and we would get trucks and pull those trailers, and every Saturday night, a team of people would turn classrooms into kids' rooms. We would turn a gym a cafetorium. A you get what I'm saying here? It was a multi -use. We would turn it into a sanctuary, into an auditorium for God's house and clean the restrooms and do all the work and all the preparation And every Saturday night. And then Sunday after we got done with church, guess what we did? Packed it all back up. And we did that for three years, 150 plus Sundays and Saturday nights, 150 weekends. And, and three years in, we got a call from Macedonia Baptist Church, a church that had been in this community, had roots, was planted in this, this community for decades. And they said to us, what would it look like for two churches to come together? And I said, I have no clue. I don't know if it'll work. And through a lot of prayer and a lot of seeking God and a lot of honest conversations, Uh, the people of Macedonia, a Southern Baptist church, and a non-denominational three-year-old young church merged together. And both churches, yeah, both churches, more Macedonia Baptist church than us laid down preference to pick up the kingdom. Well, this is how we've always done church, but what would it look like if we changed things up just a little bit to move the kingdom of God forward in a different way in this community? And the beautiful thing is that it worked. And there were some people that were against it, and, 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 and they moved on, and there was a lot that were forward, and it was just beautiful in the relationships that God formed. And let me tell you something really cool. 300 people is what we were um, on our, our, our last Sunday over at, at Eagles View. Uh, the people of Macedonia had about 60 people, and our first Sunday in this building, over 600 people showed up. Come on. Because that's how the West Side works. It was like rumor mill, like, what's going on at this church? You know, they painted the building. What's happening? We got to check it out. And, uh, and our first Sunday, and, and things just kind of took off from there. And, and uh, man, it's just, it's just been an incredible ride ever since. Uh, didn't know if we were going to survive the pandemic. That was crazy. We lost 800 people in that journey. Uh, but here we are at 11 years old, um, and the goodness and the faithfulness of God prevails. Amen? Amen. And I'm so glad that y'all are here today to celebrate with us. Woo Let's go. Come on. So my wife, you can think this is weird because I think it's weird, had a dream. We didn't have a name for the church. She had a dream, and in her dream, she saw the words rise lower down on a building. She woke up with this verse on her heart. It is our theme verse for this series. If you would, stand for the reading of God's word. Come on. Ephesians 5.14, this is why it is said, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine Woo! on you. Come, Come on. on. Let's go. Somebody say amen. Amen. Take a seat. So here's what we're looking at today. God, 11 years, this is what you've done. But if we want to keep doing this for 11 more years, you're going to call us to some greater things. You have more in store for us. We really do believe that. And so we have three thoughts that are actually going to come from the following verses after this right here. And the first thought is this. We want to make the most, come on, of every opportunity that God gives us. Yeah, so the world's going to throw out so many opportunities to us. And you'll hear, you know, seize the day and seize every single moment. But with God, we can do things a little bit differently. Ephesians 5, 16. 15 and 16 says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, 
but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And so Paul here, he's not telling you, telling us here to seize every single opportunity that's in front of us. He's saying, make the most of the opportunities that God has given you. Make the most of the days and the hours that God has blessed you with to be here on this earth. Make the most of those moments. Another translation of this verse says, to redeem the time that's been given to you. And so what Paul is saying here is, hey, take this time that God has blessed you with and actually submit it to the Lord. Because the world's going to say, you should do this, you should do that. And it might not all be bad things, but he's saying, no, let's actually redeem the things that the world's kind of throwing at us. And instead, let's take this to the Lord and say, God, what would you have me do with the time that you've given me here on this earth? What do you have for me? What opportunities are you placing in front of me that I need to grab hold of and run towards? How do you want to use me here in this life. And so the world's going to tell you what to do, but we get to look to God. That's right. We get to look to the life of Jesus. And he models so well for us how we should live and how we should position and posture ourselves. And so Jesus models for us how to serve well. Jesus models for us how to love people really well. Jesus models for us how to run towards people and be available to them. Jesus models for us how to live in community. He models for us how to be a part of a healthy church, how to use the gifts that God's placed on the inside of us. And so when you go through the growth track here at Rise Church, which is our four-week membership course, you hear us talk about something called the four Gs of Rise Church. And so we're going to look at, I'm going to look at two of those with you this morning. And so the first is gifts gifts, and that is being a part of the dream team. And we have such an incredible dream team in this place. We We got to celebrate them last night, a couple hundred people in this place getting to celebrate what God's done, but also honor and celebrate them as well. And so you all have gifts on the inside of you. God has placed some gifts inside of you, unique gifts, qualities that you have that benefit the people around you. And so these gifts that we have, we can use in all areas of our life. You use these gifts that you have in your workplace. You use them in your home. You use them with your friends, whatever. But you also have gifts in the inside of you that can benefit the body of Christ. Gifts that once they're used and submitted to the Lord, they're actually used to build up God's house, to make God's house an incredible place. And so when you, we ask you to serve here at Rise Church, it isn't because we want something from you necessarily. Do we need you to serve? Absolutely. Yes. We do. We do. We need a hundred more you of you. Because we could not do this without you. When you come in here on Sunday, it's not the two of us running around and doing everything. It's not our staff doing everything. It is our dream team out there serving. They're making the coffee. They're out there showing you where to park. They're here. They're writing your new here postcards. They're serving and using the gifts that God's placed on the inside of them to build up come and on. build the body of Christ. Come on. It is how the church was intended to function. What if they don't know what their spiritual gift is? If you don't know is. your spiritual gift, we will tell you what it is. When you go through the growth track, you actually take what we call a spiritual assessment test. And tests don't let that throw you off. It's some questions that you get Cannot to answer fail it. to find out a little bit more about yourself. And so some of the gifts that you have, you might already know that you have those gifts. You already know that's part You're of already your, using you're it already and you don't even them. know. But for others of you, you may be like, I don't know. I'm a little confused. I don't know what I can bring to the body of Christ. I don't know what I have on the inside of you. We will help you discover the gifts on the inside of you. And then we can point you in the direction and say, these gifts that you have, this is how you can use them in the body of Christ. So So you have the gift of hospitality. Hey, we're going to help. We're going to bring you into our guest services where you help us open the door and welcome people into this place. If you've got this amazing, joy-filled personality, come on. We're going to put you at the doors greeting and welcoming people, being the if you're not joyful, church, we're not putting you at the front It's not going to happen. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Go to the back. But we want you to serve. We want this for you because we want to see the gifts on the inside That's of you right. be brought That's forward. That's so good. First Peter 4.10 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. So this is what God is telling us to do. Take the gifts that I've placed on the inside of you and use them to serve people. Serve outside of this church 100%. But then when you get in this place, you say, God, here are the gifts that I have. I submit them to you. Use me in whatever way you can. And he says, use these gifts to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If God has extended his incredible grace to you, and he's changed your life, and he's set you free, and you're not the same anymore. 
faithfully steward the grace that he's given to you and use those gifts to serve somebody else. Make the most of every opportunity by saying, God, you've changed my life. You've given me your grace. I'm now going to take these gifts and I'm going to open the door for somebody else to experience the same grace that you've given me. Why? Because the days are evil. We go back to that verse, the days are evil. And so we need to wake up and use the gifts that God has given us so that we can help point people to Jesus. The second G is groups. And I'll hit this one quickly because we're going to talk about groups over the next couple of weeks. But we want you to be in godly community. You can have friends outside of this church that don't know Jesus. And that's great. We all should. We all should have friends that don't know the Lord. But there is nothing like being in a community of people who love God and are going to point you to Jesus, who are going to hold you accountable, who are going to miss you when you're not here in God's house. And so next Sunday, we're all going to get in a group. Amen? We're all going to sign up for some godly community. And if you don't see a group available for you, start it. Start the thing. We will help you get it kicked off. But there is a place for you. We all need friends who are going to point us to Jesus. So good. So we're, we're using our gifts that God's given us because hurting people are going to come through these doors and we're ready to serve them. You understand what I'm saying? Like, we're ready for you. Like, our band didn't walk up and go, what do we do today? What do we do? Will we play some music? They, they were ready. They were prepared. We prepared this message. And all the treats that you're going to get, all of that was prepared by people to love you, to show you the love of God. Do you need iced coffee to show the love of God? No. But, but it's nice. You drink it. Every week, we go through gallons of it. And we're not just giving you a coffee. We're giving you hope. Like, we're giving you a smile. We're welcoming you in our, because we were ready for you. You might have had the worst week of your life. We're ready to show you the love of God. We're ready to encourage you. And we're ready. Somebody might have rejected you this week. Not here. You're welcome here in this place. Because we're ready to use the gifts that God's given. And God wants to do that through you as well. So we're using our gifts, we're getting in groups, godly community, and then the third one is this, we're committed to the growth of this house. We're committed, now let me say this very clearly, this is not about trying to be a large church, okay? There was a time, and if you've been around here long enough, there was a time where I took a lot of pride in us being a growing church. And don't you know, the Lord will humble you very quickly in that. We're not trying to be a large church. We're not trying to go, look at us, look what's happening here. We're trying to reach people with the good news of Jesus. You hear me very clearly on that, okay? We have never set attendance record goals. By the end of 2024, we're gonna be, we've never done it and we never will because the Lord builds his church. If we stay faithful, he'll build his church. You understand what I'm saying? But we unapologetically will continue to reach people. We, I heard a pastor say, we will do anything short of sin to get people to come to know Jesus. And I'm telling you, the time is now for us to ramp up the efforts. I've given this illustration before. If you've been around our church, if you're new, you're about to be indoctrinated into Rise Church full on right now. You ready? Growing up, West Side Kid right here, all right? Nothing was better than a bowl of SpaghettiOs and wrestling on the TV. Come on, somebody. I could probably do that as an adult still. Like, let's go. SpaghettiOs don't hit like they used to. They really don't. They don't. Those meatballs, woo, come on. But I'd sit there and I'd watch my wrestling, and my favorite wrestling matches were always the tag team matches. The tag team matches. And you always had the good guys versus the bad guys, right? And the good guys would play by the rules. And if you don't know what a tag team wrestling match is, you, you probably need to find a new church. Just We probably are not... Just being honest, we're probably not the church for you. I'm just teasing. You're welcome here. We'll give you some YouTube videos to get you caught up. But the way that a tag team wrestling match works is that one of the partners is inside the ring wrestling, and the other one has to wait outside and wait till he's tagged in. Then he gets to jump in. The good guys would always follow the rules and and wait. But the bad guys, they wouldn't. They'd jump in the ring, both of them at the same time. They'd distract the referee, hit somebody with a chair. And it always played out like this because wrestling's not real. You, 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 You know that. Somebody's like, what, what? Okay, it's not. And so, um, so it's all staged. But so we would play it like this where the bad guys are just beating up on the good guy, the guy that's in the ring. Meanwhile, the guy that's on the outside of the ring, he's like, just tag my hair, come on. Just like reaching as far as he can. Like, come on, get here. And, and, the, and the guy in the ring would like barely make it and then they would drag him away. And he's like, come on. That's us. Okay? You know people that I don't know. 
you'll go into your workplace tomorrow and you will talk to people that I'll never meet. You have family members that I don't know, teenagers, you're in schools that I'll, I'll never step into. And you, you get to take the light of Jesus Christ and the love of Jesus Christ into those people's lives. And you get to tell them about God and how he's changed your life. And the prayers that they'll respond and see the God in you and want what you have. But then you also get to invite them to this place. And when you invite them, it's like we're the tag team partner on the outside of the ring. Come on. I had somebody grab me just a couple weeks ago. They're like, I got a friend. I've been inviting them and they're here today. Don't suck. I said, I got you. I got you. Can we say that? We said, we, we said it. We you said it. Did. We did. So, and so you, you're, you're already sharing Jesus with them. But when you get your friend here, you tag me in, baby. You tag us in. Oh, let me tell you about the love of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about a Savior that saw your sin and still chose to die for you. And when we work together, God's the one that changes their lives. Amen? But he'll, he'll, he'll use both of us. Well, who did it more? Both. What, did I had to get them to rise? No, no, no. You played a role too. So you keep spreading the light and love of Jesus in those people's lives. You keep inviting your friends here. Yeah, but they've said no a thousand times. Ask them one more time. You never know. Don't be a jerk about it. Don't be mean about it. Don't be cruel. Don't judge them. Just keep nudging them. Come on, hey, you want to come? Invite complete strangers. Come on, get people to the house. Why? So we can be a big church? No, 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 no. There, there is complication that comes with being a big church. I remember when we did our first First time we had to move to two services, right? We went from 300 to 600. We got to go to two services. So people were like, oh, you just like preaching twice. I hate preaching twice. I hate it. I hate preaching three times. I mean, I, I like preaching three times to people, but I, I wish I could preach one time and just go home. Jesus didn't preach three times. You don't read the Bible where Jesus just says the same thing over and over. He preached one time and he was done. Ask our Rise Kids team. Hey, you like serving in there two times, three times? You know, but, but why? Why? We're not going to stand at the doors and say, sorry, we don't have enough room for you. Go home. No, we're going to keep making room. And guess what? God's going to keep bringing more people to our church if he finds us faithful. So may we be found faithful. May we be found faithful, Rise Church, to see more people go from death to life. Come on. And I'm going to need some of y'all to get on board with the vision. Get in growth track. Start serving, start contributing, start letting God use you, which is point number four, the last G, is giving. And I'm going to speed through this one as fast as I can. This is my favorite point. Invest financially in this house. The first offering we took was in a KFC bucket. I rolled through the KFC. I said, I need a bucket. She said, how many pieces? I said, just the bucket. I didn't have any money. I didn't have a job. She said, what are you doing with the bucket? I said, well, I started this church. There's 11 of us, and we're going to take up an offering, and we don't have money to buy an offering bucket. Can I have a She threw a couple pieces of chicken in there for me. She felt so bad. <laughs> this is not the original bucket. I wish it was. When we had KFC, we just dubbed it. We said, keep it freaking coming, man. Like, <laughs> like we, got, we got stuff to do around here. Let, we're taking up this offering every week. Let's go. And, and can I tell you something? 11 years ago in our living room, the people that gave, you're reaping the benefit of it today. You understand that, right? The chair you're sitting in, this, like, none of this is free because people gave. You're reaping the benefit because people gave. We're able to do online technology for anybody that's watching online right now. That's, that's a beauty. And we were hanging out with some pastor friends this week of some pretty large churches. Uh, we were together in Orlando at a conference, and, and they were sharing some crazy stories of just, like, generosity in their church. Now, like, one person was like, you're not going to believe this. Somebody wrote a $500,000 check to our church just last week. Whoa. Somebody else was like, we just got a million dollar check. And I was just like, that's, that's not our story. One day. One day? Yes. One day. That's not our, you know what our story is? Blue collar workers. Faithfully giving week in and week out, month in and month out. Giving when, when it's tough. Giving faithfully. But can I share something with you? About 20 to 25% of our church gives faithfully. You might give every once in a while, but I'm talking about faith, consistent, faithful. 
That means 75% of our church is not giving and investing in this house. There's no judgment. I would say, why? For all of us, there's different reasons. And we will never make you feel guilty, and we will never condemn you, and there is always a place for you here. But the invitation is, the invitation is, let me do a gamble real quick. This is a gamble, but I think it's going to pay off. Raise your hand if Jesus has changed your life since you started coming to this church. Okay. So that's why we give. Why do we give? Because God wants my money? No, God wants your heart. God doesn't need your money. He's walking on streets of gold right now. He's good. All right? Stubbed his toe on a brick of gold. You know what I'm saying? God's good. Well, you want my money. then? No, we don't want your money. We're, we're surviving without your money right now. Our church is thriving without your money right now. So, so do we want? No. We want you to trust God, and we want you to invest in God's kingdom. And so here's, here's, here's what God put on my heart, and then we're going to move on. There's somebody in this house today, multiple of you. Today's going to be the first day you start giving, and you're never going to look back. You're going to start trusting God. I really believe that. I really believe that. And then, and then this is, this is bold, but let me say it like this. Somebody in here, you have the means of giving in abundance. It might not be 500000 or maybe. <laughs> just, that, just throwing that out there. Just throwing that out there. You, but you do have the means of giving in abundance. And maybe you've been wrestling with it for a while. Be obedient. If it's not our church, bless another church. Be, but be obedient. And I just felt like the Lord put that on my heart. Amen? Amen. We got to speed this up, babe, because I went too long on the yeah. wrestling match thing. Yeah. Point number two, okay. don't be foolish, be filled. We need the Holy Spirit to Come fill on. us, go. to lead us, and to guide us. Ephesians 5, let's look down at 17 and 18. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. I don't know about you, but I did not know how to say debauchery or what it meant. I had to look that up on Google. And I don't think most of us are walking around using that word in a sentence today. But what it means is to live foolishly, to do foolish things, typically accompanied by some type of substance. Anybody want to admit you've had some debauchery moments in your life, some foolish moments in your life? Come on, I think we pastor a church on the west side. We know you. We know you. The 11.30 crowd's going to be like, whoa! All of them. But what this verse is saying is don't be controlled by anything other than the Spirit of God. Don't be controlled by anything other than the Holy Spirit. And so for all of us today, it might not be a substance that's controlling us, but it's our flesh. And Pat, he talked about this last week, that our flesh is us. Our flesh is us what and we our want core. to do. What we want, our selfish desires, our frustrations, all of us is our flesh. And so we have to be willing as followers of Jesus. When you say yes to a relationship with God, you're saying, God, I'm laying my flesh down. I'm laying myself down and I'm picking up the spirit of God. I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to fill me. Yeah, but this is a process we have to continue to do. We have to wake up in the morning and say, less of me, God, yeah. and more of you today. Let me lay down my flesh and my desires and my sinful nature, and let me pick up the Spirit of God. And when I'm filled with the Spirit of God, I'm not going to live foolishly because the Spirit of God's going to hold me back from the foolishness. It's the Spirit of God on the inside of you that's going to convict you when you're about to do something or say something or operate in a way that you know you shouldn't. And the Spirit of God comes in, but we will not be filled if we don't allow him to fill us. And so we have to say, God, whatever's on the inside of me that shouldn't be there, let's get rid of it. Whatever's in my heart that shouldn't be there, God, let's move it out of the way because I want to make, I want to make room for the Holy Spirit to fill me. And what does the Holy Spirit do for us? He leads us and he guides us. John 14, 25 says, but the advocate the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. This is Jesus talking to to the disciples. He will teach you all things, and he will remind you of everything I have said to you. So the Holy Spirit will teach you. He will fill you with wisdom. He will help you make decisions. If you allow him to work on the inside of you, he will lead you. He will guide you. And then he will remind you of what Jesus has already taught you. He will remind you of what Jesus has already done for you. He will always point you to the truth of God's word. And if you let the spirit of God fill you, he's going to help you. 
He's going to help you. So every day it's, God, I lay myself down so and I pick up the spirit. I lay down who I am and I pick up the Holy Spirit and watch your life look a lot less foolish than it once did and now be walking in the wisdom of who the Holy Spirit is on the Come inside on. of so you. Come on, so good. So the Bible will use contrasting language to describe your life before Jesus and your life after Jesus. So if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, you've never called him to come into your life, you're going to fall in the first category. That's where you are right now. And I don't know if you are going to agree with me, but that's that's clear. And if you have been changed by Jesus, you have called upon him as your Lord and Savior, you're going to fall in the second category. Amen? All right? So here's what it will tell us. Hey, before, you were lost. But because of Jesus, he came and he found you. Thought I might get one amen. That's okay. I got, I got more. I got more. You were blind. Didn't know what you were doing in life. But now your eyes have been opened. Now you can see. All right, we're on a roll here. Wait, well, hey, you were foolish. I pity the fool. Come on, Mr. T. But now you got wisdom. Now you're making better choices. Maybe you used to get filled with alcohol. Now you get filled with the Spirit of God. Listen, I've never been drunk a day in my life. I don't need alcohol. I just, I'm Captain Fun over here. Like, literally do not need it. My wife, from time to time, I don't know if this is right. She said, I just wonder what you would be like wasted. I don't know. We'll never see. Maybe we will. Probably not. We won't. I don't think we'll see. I don't want to go that route. Here's what I'm saying. Ain't going down like that. All right? Here's what I'm saying. Like, the message isn't don't get drunk so you can go to heaven. The message is, like, that's not who you are anymore. Your life's been changed. So, so Paul's saying, don't get, don't get drunk with wine because there's a better way. I love how the New Living says it like this. Don't, don't get drunk with wine, or, and you're like, oh, wine, okay, I can drink beer. It's all alcohol, people, okay? All right, come on. <laughs> because that will ruin your life. Raise your hand if your life or somebody you know's life has been ruined by alcohol. I've never seen a commercial of, of, of beer where somebody's just puking their guts out and hung over. They don't show that, do they? Where they're ruining their family because alcohol is just, just wrecking havoc on their marriage and their kids. You don't see those commercials, do you? That's what it'll do, though. That's why Paul says, instead. So don't do this because there's a better way. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, Galatians says that these things will start to come out of our life. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Even if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, even if you don't think God's real, if people live by this, would our world be better? So then that's why we say we need Jesus, because only Jesus can produce this. We talked about the flesh. The flesh is the opposite of this. If I'm not showing love, I'm not showing joy, I'm not peaceful, I'm not patient, if I'm irritated, discouraged, frustrated, angry all the time, that's me. I need what only the Holy Spirit can produce in me. So anytime I acknowledge, man, I am mad right now, I'm angry, I'm ticked off, and I just stay in that, I need to be able to look inwardly and go, oh, God, change me. Fill me with love. Fill me with joy. Fill me with peace. When the Holy Spirit fills me, guess what? I have a better marriage. She likes me a lot better when the Holy Spirit's filling me. My kids like me a lot better. Trust me, you like me a lot better as your, could you imagine if I was an angry pastor all the time, just yelling at you? We would not have three services, I'll tell you that right now. Be filled. Come on. Hey, listen. Some of you, you, got, you, have, a, you have an alcohol problem. Let's, let's just identify this. And I didn't say this in the last service because I think some of you in 10 o'clock need to hear this. It, it's got a hold on you. And it's doing more damage than you realize. Lay it down. I promise you, you will not regret it. No. But I need that drink to have a good time. Drink a Mountain Dew, man. <laughs> drink a bottle of water. Let's go. And remember the next day. Praise the Lord. Let's go. Point number three. <laughs> Point number three. For, hey, for the next 11 years, you okay if we do this? We're going to proclaim God's goodness. Yeah. Let's go. Our response, to, our response to waking up, our response to making the most of the life that God has given us and being filled with the Spirit is that we're going to proclaim God's goodness. We're going to let our lives pour out praise and gratitude to God. Let's look back at our scripture. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns and songs from the spirit. I'd love for us to start greeting each other with psalms and hymns. How and are you today? Let's do it. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so how I interpret this scripture is when we're filled with the spirit of God, praise and gratitude should naturally flow out of our lives. When we are filled with God's spirit, 
Worship should flow from our lives. We shouldn't be able to contain it. God, this is who I was, and this is who Woo! I am now. That's it. You changed my That's life, it. and so now praise and gratitude are what's gonna pour out of me. So when you come in here on a Sunday morning, it is an overflow. It is an overflow of what God's done. And praise and gratitude and being filled with God's spirit, they all go together. So as you praise him, you're actually being filled more with the spirit of God. Yeah. It's this beautiful process. So come, be filled with his spirit, pour out praise and gratitude. Allow Allow God to fill you with more of his spirit, pour out your praise and your gratitude. And so over the last 11 years, we've seen God do some incredible right. things. Yes, we we've seen life change. We've seen salvations. Yeah. We've seen marriages healed. We've seen physical bodies healed. We've Come seen on. baptisms Come galore. Come on. And so our response is always going to be God, not to us, but to your name, be the glory and the honor. And we're going to give him all of the praise that he deserves for what we've seen him do. Here's what I found in my life. I stop praising God when I forget what he's done. If you're here this morning and you had trouble singing the songs that we sang, maybe it's because you've forgotten what God has done for you. And so come on, in this moment, can we just pause and just reflect and remember, God, you loved me when I didn't deserve it. Jesus, you died for me when I was at my worst. You forgave the same sin that I repeated over and over again and over. We are repeat offenders, and his forgiveness flows freely towards us. There's a song that I find myself singing, and I wanted to share with you the words. If you need to know the name of the song, it's called what? Sure been good. That's what it's called. The song goes like this. You didn't have to take my sin. You didn't have to call me friend. You didn't have to take my shame, and you didn't have to call my name. You didn't have to die for me, and you didn't have to set me free. That's beautiful, right? The very next line says, but you did, and I won't forget it. You didn't have to do any of that for me, but you did it, and I'm not gonna forget it. Here's what I've learned in my life. When I remember what the Lord has done, gratitude builds in my heart. When that gratitude builds so much in my heart, it cannot stay in my heart. Therefore, I begin to praise him with my mouth. Would you stand to your feet this morning, Rise Church? Can we remember the Lord? Can we remember his goodness?